press on to our next speaker. And uh, I have to say I'm delighted that Mojo Network's uh, CEO, Rick Wilmer, is here. And uh, Rick, come on up here. Good morning, Klaus. Welcome, sir. Good to be here. Fantastic company, and I want to thank you for your su support of Wi-Fi now as an organization there for a long time. And uh, you guys are doing some fantastic work on massive scale Wi-Fi, so please tell us all about it. Uh, happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, good morning, everybody. Great to be here in The Hague. And as Klaus mentioned, I'm the CEO of Mojo Networks. If you don't know Mojo Networks, um, we're a company that's a little under two years old, but we've been around longer than that. And we're prior, prior uh, to two years ago known as Airtight Networks. And we were a real pioneer in wireless security and wireless intrusion prevention. Um, today, we're about a little under 350 people uh, based in Silicon Valley, and the growth we're experiencing, uh, and I'll describe the solution that we provide, or at least part of it in this, in this presentation, is phenomenal. Uh, we're more than doubling uh, the size of our company on a year-over-year -year basis uh, based on the reception to what we've developed and are, are bringing to the market. So I'm going to talk about... There we go. Massively scalable Wi-Fi networks. And when I talk about, uh, when, I, when I mention massively scalable, I'm talking about massively scalable. Uh, 10,000, 100,000, million plus AP deployments. Uh, so this is uh, networks that are uh, bigger than, than things we've been used to in this industry historically. So who actually cares about scaling to this level of magnitude? Well, I can tell you it's a, a lot of people in this world that care. Um, one obvious use case uh, would be what we call smart campus. This could be a very large university campus, a very large corporate campus where you've got pervasive Wi-Fi throughout the entire um, area of the institution and you're enabling all kinds of interesting use cases because you have ubiquitous pervasive Wi-Fi coverage. Another use case is smart cities. A lot of discussion on this topic yesterday. Uh, this could be public Wi-Fi access uh, all the way through to uh, all the smart applications that may live in a smart city where you're now connecting things uh, to a network over Wi-Fi. And perhaps the most important constituency that really cares about this are what I call the underserved of the world. Um, we don't have ubiquitous internet access across this planet. Uh, based on the World Economic Forum estimates, there's probably 4 billion people in this world that don't have internet connectivity. Um, that's a big problem, and there's a lot of issues that are preventing that problem from being resolved. One of those is affordability. Um, Google and Facebook are both making valiant attempts to solve this problem with some success. And I'm uh, very much a fan of what they're trying to do uh, to bring the benefits of internet connectivity to the underserved of the world. But to make that happen, uh, you're talking about making internet affordable in developing countries where a lot of people don't have a lot of disposable income to spend on internet connectivity. So I'll talk about what we're doing uh, to address these kinds of use cases for massively scalable Wi-Fi. What's required uh, to cover those use cases and address these problems are two things. One is a new Wi-Fi architecture, and the second is a new business model. In terms of a Wi-Fi architecture, uh, this needs to be a fully virtualized architecture. Everything needs to be defined by software. It needs to support cellular offload. It needs to be flexible in terms of its interfaces, because many of those very large deployments are, are, are uh, deployed by service providers, and they need to integrate with BSS and OSS, as well as CRM systems, technical support systems, etc. You need to be able to automatically provision. If you're rolling out 10,000 APs a week into a country, if that's not a seamless automated uh, process, uh, you won't reach that, that level of rate of deployment. From a network operations standpoint, this needs to be manageable on a massive scale. And what that means is you've got information, not just a bunch of pretty data on a user interface, but you've got real information that you can act on 
when you have issues or problems in the network. You need to be able to identify problems quickly and get to the root cause rapidly so you can solve them. And you need a, a, a solution that can heal itself. And that is what Mojo is all about. Uh, two years ago, or a little under two years ago, when we were born as Mojo Network, I would have described us as a Wi-Fi company. Today, I describe us as an AI company more than a Wi-Fi company. The third piece, or the second piece of the puzzle, is around the business model. And I'll talk about this quite a bit in the uh, second part of the presentation. But what needs to happen is a concept called disaggregation. Uh, this has been happening in the data center in a big way, and it has to do with separating your hardware purchase from your software purchase. And it enables a much more affordable, much more cost-effective solution. And for use cases like developing countries where you're serving people that don't have a lot of money to spend on internet connectivity, this is critical to get the affordability problem solved for those types of use cases. So, this can't be done with controller architectures. Uh, a lot of people in our company have been in this industry since it was born, and this architecture won't do this kind of scale. It's too complex, there's too much hardware required, and it's way too expensive. And I'll show you some real data on this as I go through the slide deck. What you need is a fully virtualized architecture. And you're going to, what we've done is exploited all the technology innovations that have happened in more fundamental areas of technology to develop this architecture. Uh, this architecture was born in the cloud. Now, we're not a company that started off with controller-based architecture and then abstracted the controller software into the cloud. We built this from scratch. And what we've exploited in one instance, when you see the control plane down there, is we've exploited the fact that today's Wi-Fi chipsets have an incredible amount of microprocessing horsepower. Uh, you can do a lot of work at the edge of the network that you couldn't do in prior generations of Wi-Fi chipsets. We've exploited that to move the control plane into the edge of the network. Think of a group of Mojo access points that can see one another as a collective brain that is managing the control plane. The data plane is flexible, and the management plane is the only thing that's centralized in the cloud. Uh, this makes for a very efficient design when it comes to the amount of traffic moving over the WAN back to the cloud. It also makes for a very resilient architecture where if you lose the connection to the cloud, nothing stops working. The entire network stays up and runs, your security postures remain in place, everything stays uh, functional. Now, the most important thing we've done is what we call the fourth plane or the cognition plane. This is where we have become subject matter experts in artificial intelligence. Now, it's a rather narrow scope of AI compared to other use cases that uh, are utilizing AI. This is specific to networking. And what we're doing with the cloud, like we've exploited the microprocessing capabilities and the access points, we're exploiting the unlimited storage and compute available in the cloud to store massive data sets and apply machine learning and artificial intelligence to those data sets to effectively predict what the network will do next based on what it's done historically. With that information, we can automatically remediate problems before they affect users. This is a very powerful technology that we've developed. Another piece of this technology, which I don't even show on this slide, is that many of our large-scale deployments utilize three radio APs, which are rather unique in the industry. Uh, we have a 2.4 gig access radio and a 5 gig access radio, but then we have a dual band third radio, and we call that a multifunction radio. In many instances, it can provide wireless intrusion prevention on a full-time basis. It's a continuous RF scanning radio that's continually, continuously watching the dynamically changing RF environment and feeding that data into our cloud, into our AI engine, to make intelligent decisions about the RF environment. The other thing that it does, and uh, one of the gentlemen yesterday from Hub One, uh, Jean Christophe, talked about his test and learn approach, is that third radio can be provisioned as a simulated client 
and automatically test the network with, very, with specific applications, either on a schedule or on an on-demand basis. So the whole concept of test and learn has been automated within this cognitive Wi-Fi architecture. Uh, what this also provides is unprecedented network visibility. Because we have unlimited data storage available in the cloud, we store everything from the entire instantiation of a session, from getting onto a, a network to association and authentication, through getting uh, an IP address. We track all that data. So we heard a couple of presenters yesterday talk about something that we hear all the time, which is the Wi-Fi network isn't very good here, and it turns out that it's some wired network service that's causing the problem. And we, because of the unlimited storage we have available in the cloud, we can watch all that happen. All those handshakes, all those transactions happen. And if you're having a user experience problem, the ability to troubleshoot instantly is remarkable with this kind of architecture. So this is now on to the economic model. And I'm really talking about a big trend that's happened in the data center and drawing that analogy and now moving it out to the edge of the network. But this is the way I explain what's happening when we talk about hardware and software disaggregation. So this is what I call old school networking systems, fully integrated hardware and software. Okay, there's network vendor A's solution. Okay, there is network vendor B with his fully integrated solution and the highly innovative vendor C. I've never seen vendor C in a market before. All those vendors typically make 70% margins on those fully integrated solutions. So let me break that down now. The chassis, or in Mojo's case, the access point, is the container, it's the egg carton. It's a delivery vehicle that gets the value from point A to point B. When you go and buy eggs at the market, you're not gonna use the carton after the eggs are gone. They're getting the eggs from the grocery store into your refrigerator at home. The egg is where the value is for you as the egg buyer. And my analogy here is that the egg yolk is the silicon could be a Wi-Fi chipset, could be a microprocessor, memory storage, whatever. Uh, the next speaker up, my friend Gopi Serenini from Qualcomm, will talk about some amazing innovation that's happening in the area of Wi-Fi chipsets. And then the egg white is the software that makes the entire system run. That is where the value is created. That's what a customer is paying for. So if you break down the way the value is created in these different areas, be it the carton, the yolk, or the egg white, the chip designer creates the chip. They design the chip, they manufacture the chip, and they sell that, in the case of Wi-Fi and many other networking systems nowadays, to an outsourced design manufacturer or an, what, what we call an ODM that is based in Asia. Uh, that ODM will then use that chip set to design the egg carton, and then manufacture it with very little touch and input from the company that's going to ultimately sell the solution. The value in the uh, software is very high, just like it is in the chipset. And that's what we, as a networking vendor, create. We're a software company, an AI company writing code. So that old business model of the fully integrated system is changing and it's changing in a big way and it started in the data center and it's clearly pushing its way out of networking into storage and compute as well as out to the edge of the network and there's two reasons why number one vendors are taking too much margin for things that they did not create any value on in the old school model if our company had purchased a chipset from Qualcomm, a Wi-Fi chipset from Qualcomm, used a manufacturer in Asia to design an access point around that chipset and then manufacture it, and then marked it up by 70%, we're marking up a chipset that we did not innovate, we did not invent, we did not manufacture, and we're charging an additional 70% margin on top of that. The market has figured this out, and they know that vendors don't deserve 70% margins for things that they did not create nor invent. 
The other problem with fully integrated proprietary systems is that the pace of innovation is clearly not keeping up with the demands of the customers. Uh, when you step back and look at what's going on, particularly in the data center, but even now towards the edge of the network, it's remarkable to me what's happening in the customer base. You have groups like the Open Networking Users Group, the Open Networking Forum, the Open Compute Project. Go read their mission statements, and I'll tell you what they say in very polite terms. What they say is the networking industry is not innovating fast enough, and because of the invention of SDN or NFV or VFN or whatever you want to call it, but a world defined by software, we as customers are taking matters into our own hands using that technology to innovate faster because our vendors aren't meeting our requirements. The world is changing and we need to embrace it and we as Mojo are definitely embracing it. So, this is what the new world looks like and I am convinced that this is the way everything in the world of IT is gonna go. Hardware will become open standards based where you can run any software stack on any hardware platform and they're assured to work together. It'll be available, the hardware will be available from multiple vendors so you have assurance of supply and it will be commodity priced. It will be commensurate with the value that is being delivered to the end user. This is the egg carton, okay? It's not that valuable to the end user. We've already implemented the commodity pricing piece of this puzzle. Uh, realizing that this is the future of enterprise and massively scalable Wi-Fi, we made the decision a while back to make no margin on access points. We passed those through to our users at cost with 0% margin because that puts us in a mindset to drive an open standard. If you have something to lose, like 70% margins on hardware, you can't drive an open standard. You only can do that if you have nothing to lose, which is why we made the strategic decision to go to commodity-based pricing out of the factory type of costs for all of our hardware that we provide to all of our customers. Now, clearly, that also solved another major problem, particularly in the developing countries of the world. This made for a much more affordable solution. The last piece on the hardware side in the new world is that it's available without software, and it can be purchased by a customer from a hardware vendor without any code on it. On the software side, it can be loaded onto any hardware platform. It's open standards or API based. And what that allows for is a community of developers to work against the platform. This increases the pace of innovation. You're no longer relying on a single vendor, vendor to innovate when it comes to the networking functionality that a particular customer may need. And lastly, it can be sold without hardware. And an end customer, if an st open standard has been ratified, can then be assured that if they combine a certain software package with a certain hardware platform, it will work together. So this is the, the, the new world, and we are driving towards an open standard in the Wi-Fi industry, in the enterprise Wi-Fi industry. I dream of the day when a customer of ours can buy any access point from any one of our competitors, plug it into our cloud, have us put some code on that access point and have the cloud manage that access point. And vice versa, all of our innovative hardware platforms, our three radio access points, I would gladly make those available to any other enterprise Wi-Fi vendor if they'd like to download their software stack onto those APs and plug them into their management system, I would absolutely welcome that. That is what's best for the market, that's what be that what's best for the customers, that's what's be best for the industry. And there's no technical reason this can't happen. This will lead to faster innovation, it'll lead to lower costs, it'll eliminate the concept of vendor lock-in and give customers a lot more diversity of choice to move from vendor to vendor if they're not satisfied with their current vendor. So technically this is all possible. We've now proven that this is doable. There's no technical reason you can't have an open standard around Wi-Fi access points. We are very active members of the Open Compute Project. If you don't know about the Open Compute Project, go take a look at their website and their membership. Um, what they're driving is this whole concept of disaggregation, commodity-priced 
hardware, egg cartons, available from multiple vendors that can be paired with software that's assured to work on those hardware platforms to drive costs down. The technology that exists with an open compute, which was contributed by Cumulus Networks, is called the Open Network Install Environment. It's a bootloader technology that if it exists in access points and you have a compliant firmware stack with the ONIE standard, you're assured that you can load that firmware stack onto that access point and that combination of firmware and hardware will work. This is what we're driving towards. It's not a reality today. We've brought the pricing model to the market already, but the actual interoperability standard is still a ways away. Uh, if you're interested in helping, believe this is the future, feel free to join up on Open Compute and, uh, and join the cause. So this is an example of what it looks like uh, compared to uh, the old controller-based architectures. Uh, this is uh, real data for a one million access point deployment. And we're comparing a Mojo fully virtualized cloud solution to a controller-based solution. You can just look at the resources that are required for a controller-based architecture versus a fully virtualized cloud architecture like ours. More importantly, or maybe just as importantly, the actual hardware cost, the cost of the solution, the cloud plus the hardware, in this case was about 80% less expensive than the equivalent controller-based solution. Uh, with that kind of cost reduction, you're now getting to the point where you have a cost model that is viable in the developing countries of the world, where you've got a population of citizens that can't afford very much to access the internet. And today, because they can't afford it, aren't enjoying the benefits of internet access. So this is real. Uh, this is happening today. This may be one of the largest Wi-Fi deployments in the world under one single management system. This is about 100,000 APs, uh, ramping to a million, serving over a million clients a day. This network is live as we speak and passing about 100 terabytes a day of traffic through the network. So it is happening and we've proven that it can work and it, uh, quite frankly, I'm very proud of, of what our company's accomplished. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Rick, come on over here, <coughs> Great presentation. And when I think about, uh, when I first knew you, uh, I think previous to you coming on board, it was Airtight Networks, and you've yep. turned out, turned around the entire company. You also completely reinvented the architecture and everything. It's a tremendous accomplishment. Yeah. So uh, Thank you. you guys have come a long way. So let me just ask you a couple of things. Uh, and there's a there's a lot of stuff in your presentation I'd like to ask you about, but we only got a few minutes. <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I picked up on the offload story, and this is something that um, you know I've been ha had an interest for for many years. Mm -hmm and it sort of was a buzzword for a while and kind of went away, and it's, there seems to be a little bit of a resurgence. Do you have any more details that you can share with us on that? Are you seeing some more interest in, oh, in offload? Abso absolutely, we're seeing interest, especially when you have a large telco uh, rolling out Wi-Fi in combination with 4G. Uh, what we're seeing is telcos, again, back to the affordability question, trying to limit the capacity use on the license spectrum and offload that to Wi-Fi uh, wherever possible to extend the utilization of the of the license spectrum mm -hmm. and bring down the overall cost of the solution. Mm -hmm. This is critical in again developing countries where you don't have a population of people with a lot of uh, a lot of disposable income to to pay for internet access. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and is this, for example, I don't want to put you too much in the spot on the spot, but is this, for example, happening in happening in India? Are you free to talk? Oh yeah, something? that that use case that I showed. Obviously, yeah. if you know your geography, that was India. <laughs> That's uh, absolutely a Wi-Fi okay. offload use case. Yeah. And in terms of the new architecture, the open Wi-Fi essentially mm -hmm. architecture. Uh, I think it's still fairly early days. I know you guys are pushing hard for this. And there's a couple of issues, right? Because first of all, it is fairly disruptive, I should think, mm -hmm. towards num uh, many other vendors, I guess, that are not involved in, in, in this initiative. Uh, so you, you're getting some pushback. Is it, is it proceeding and when can we expect to see it or is it already in place? In oh, no, it's not in place. This is, this is going to be a long, interesting journey. Uh -huh. um, and again, the, the, the issue is that 
when you're moving to a business model like this, you have a lot to lose. If you've been making big margins on access points historically, and you're now going to make the decision to give those margins away so you can benefit the customer and the market with more choice, the ability to replace a management system without ripping and replacing the APs, and the ability to get this at a much lower price, uh -huh. you're making a massive sacrifice yes. in, in, for the benefit of the market. Uh, this will be a tough decision for a lot of companies to make. As a smaller company, as a newer company, this is, was clearly easier for us to commit to this than it would be for a larger, more, more well-established mm -hmm. company. But I believe when you look at the momentum for hardware software disaggregation that's happened in the data center, it's inevitable that this change will occur. Mm -hmm. And rather than wait to have it forced down our throats, we might as well embrace it and lead the charge than be a victim of, of this kind of change that's clearly going to happen in the industry. Right, and we talked all day pretty much yesterday about the value of Wi-Fi from uh, uh, infrastructure point of view being in the software, right? And you're actually, what you're doing here is really taking that to the extreme, exactly. right? Exactly. And, and so that's just yet another trend. It applies as well to uh, infrastructure on, on the enterprise and carrier side as well as it does to home, which, which we talked about yesterday, yeah. right? So that's the thing. Uh, tell us a little bit about sort of the on-the-ground experience with AI or networking AI uh, that you already have. I mean, to what extent is it measurable that, uh, for example, for your India project or any other deployment, that this has really increased the efficiency, that this has been a success for the service providers or enterprises involved? Do you have any feedback? Oh, yeah, that? numerous, numerous use cases and feedback. Mm -hmm. If you're curious to see it at work, go visit our, our booth over here. We've got a full demo of, of how the whole UI visualizes the artificial intelligence at play. Uh -huh. But we have a lot of interesting use cases. We deploy into, ironically, a bunch of prisons in the US through a system integrator that's providing hardened tablets to give access to prisoners so they can you know, rent games or movies or consume educational content. And prison is a brutal RF environment, all reinforced concrete walls, ceilings, and floors. Hard to get Wi-Fi signals around in that environment. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about automatically changing RF settings or understanding how the wired network services are behaving to get a prisoner connected with his hardened tablet to learn how to become a plumber when he gets released. We have done amazing things in helping that customer solve numerous problems in these different, very difficult physical environments mm -hmm. through the AI mm -hmm. to allow instantaneous troubleshooting or even the reme automated remediation of problems before they ever affect a user. Mm -hmm. And this is also very much about, um, for example, if it's a new deployment, uh, the OPEX, right? It, it, it's an OPEX thing. I understand that there's a big CapEx savings as well, not having all those mm -hmm. boxes around. But it's also an OPEX thing that you can, you, you have a few people managing this because the system is intelligent, right? I mean, that's Yeah, if I go back to the India use case slide, if you looked at the bottom of that slide and looked at the number of people that are required to manage the right. network and support deployment and provisioning, we have a tiny little team of people <laughs> that are running a network of 100,000 APs, and we will add very few people as we ramp that to a million access right, points. Right. It's fantastic work, Rick. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. and enlightening us, and uh, please come back and see us again. I Thanks will. a lot. We will. <laughs> right. Thank you very Take much. Care.